Hello everyone. It's been over a month and 15 year old Sebastian Rogers is still missing. So we need to talk about some very strange new information that's been coming out behind the scenes in his case and investigation. I've been following all of the interviews and the drama and let me tell you there is a lot of it. So today I wanted to just compile a video where we talk about all of this stuff together so we can all have a conversation down in the comment section below. So before we get into this new information, I want to clarify some past information that we've talked about in previous videos. The two flashlights that were seen on surveillance video have now been debunked to be a garbage truck coming in the early morning. As far as Seth Rogers has said in an interview, he actually got to view the original video from this. And he claims that this surveillance video that was released to the public was actually a cropped image of a bigger video. And it actually shows a lot more than we got to see. And it actually was in fact some garbage trucks that were coming in actually not even at 3 a.m. as everyone has thought. This video allegedly actually took place maybe around 5 or 6 a.m., but the timestamp was off apparently. But that does make sense to me if there was garbage trucks coming in the early morning, that that's why police eventually went and searched landfills in case that Sebastian was possibly murdered, thrown in the garbage can, and then was dumped in a landfill. However, when police did search the landfill, there was no signs of Sebastian or anything that belonged to him. Seth Rogers is also now saying that police have told him that the scent dogs never tracked to that construction site that was near the home. However, Katie and Chris have been very adamant that scent dogs did track around the home and they did track away from the home. So what is the truth here? That's the big question. All of this is critical information to the timeline and to what possibly happened to Sebastian. So if people are being given false information, such as these flashlights in the middle of the night and scent dogs tracking places, that completely throws off where to look, what may be suspicious or not suspicious. So it's deterring people from sending in tips, et cetera, et cetera. It's just a big mess, it seems. But what's even bigger is the new allegations coming out against Chris Proudfoot, Sebastian's stepfather. Chris's ex-wife, Nina, who he has a daughter with, and who he's been in all of these legal battles with recently that we've been hearing about, actually went on a YouTuber's channel and did an interview where she told her side of the story. And what she had to say about what happened between her and Chris, it, it's, it's damning stuff in my opinion. From the consensus that I've been seeing, a lot of people are believing her story and I'm one of them. There's just too many parallels with what she says to what's happening now. now. I'm gonna give you a very brief rundown on the two hour interview she ended up doing where she told her story, but there's many things that I wanna point out from what she said, because not only are these accusations alarming, but they reflect what's happening in present time with Sebastian's case. There's patterns. I'm seeing a lot of patterns. Nina spoke a lot about when she was first with Chris, there were a lot of red flags in how Chris parented her children from her past relationship. She actually had a son and a daughter. Her son was around three years old and her daughter was just a little bit older than that. And she had that from a previous marriage where she was in that relationship and married to that man for almost a decade, it seemed. And one of the first big red flags was Chris disciplining her three-year-old son. And she alleges that he was extremely rough with her three-year-old son saying, and I quote, he needs to learn how to be a man end quote, which is very eerily similar to the Elijah Vu case where his mother's boyfriend at the time was disciplining him as well, saying very similar things about how he needed to learn how to be a man. And she was alarmed by this. And so was I, because he was only three years old when he was saying this. A three-year-old does not need to learn how to be a man. He needs to just be a toddler and be a child. On another occasion, she alleges that Chris backhanded her daughter when she didn't want to get her nails cut. And when he backhanded her, her braces actually split her lip open. She then went on the claim that he did something very similar to her three-year-old son when he backhanded the three-year-old while he was in his car seat, causing his lip to be split open. So that's two allegations right there of Chris abusing children, in my opinion, which is very alarming but unfortunately it would get worse. Eventually Nina would actually get pregnant with Chris's child. She claims that Chris actually wanted her to terminate the pregnancy. However, she did not believe in that. She did not want to terminate the pregnancy. And so she ended up keeping the baby and she tried to get Chris to feel the baby when she was kicking, but Chris refused to feel the baby even. She then claims that Chris hated the fact that his daughter was going to be mixed with Mexican American and Native American because that is Nina's heritage. She'd eventually move away from home because it seemed at the time Chris was in the military station in San Diego. However, she didn't feel right about things that were going on, it seems. So she moved back home. And when she moved back home, she alleges that Chris began giving away and selling her furniture and her children's furniture from their home. All of this seemed to be red flags that were just piling up and piling up and that Nina was kind of ignoring at the time. Despite Chris not wanting this baby, she claims that when she did go into labor, Chris began calling the hospital and harassing the staff there to the point where she alleges that staff had to tell Chris that he needed to leave or they were going to have to get security to kick him out basically. Now, when she ended up bringing the baby home, Nina makes even further accusations about Chris's 
violence towards children, if you want to put it that way. She claims that at one point, because she was still recovering from having a C-section, she wasn't able to get up as fast and go comfort the baby as soon as she started crying, when they started crying. So according to Nina, she claims that Chris grabbed the car seat that Faith was laying in and began to slam the car seat against the wall because he was frustrated that the baby was crying. She then claimed that he threw the car seat onto the coffee table. Keep in mind, a newborn baby is in this car seat. Terrifying accusations in my opinion. After giving birth to a daughter who they would end up naming Faith, Nina claims that Chris and his family concocted a plan to kidnap her child from her. She claims that Chris would eventually convince her to pick up her life and completely leave and move away from her family with her children and all moved to Hendersonville County, Tennessee, where his family was, which is also the same town where Sebastian Rogers would disappear from. And she claims this was because he was attempting to isolate her because she didn't know anyone in Tennessee. All her family was back in New Mexico. So he was essentially taking her away and isolating her in this home where she didn't know anyone, she didn't have any friends. However, all of Chris's family was there. Now, Chris would eventually go back to working in San Diego and that left Nina at this home in Tennessee by herself with the three children. And this is when Chris's family began to move in and get more comfortable and start babysitting the children often. Things would eventually take a turn in this nightmare and kind of be the catalyst to all of this when Nina's older daughter ended up getting a respiratory infection and having to be hospitalized. And so Nina ended up having to have her son being taken care of by Chris's sister, Melissa, actually. His sister, Melissa, is also someone who we've talked about in Sebastian's disappearance because she was one of the last people to see him alive that day before he went missing. And so Melissa and her husband ended up watching Nina's son and baby Faith ended up being babysat by Chris's mother. Now, all of that seems fine. You know, family helping, you know, extended family. Great. However, when Nina's daughter ended up being discharged from the hospital and she contacted Chris's family saying that her son and Faith could come back home now because she was going to be home. Her son ended up showing back up. Melissa came, dropped off her son. However, baby Faith never showed up. Chris's mother never showed up with the baby. And just five minutes after returning home, a knock would come at the door. Turns out that Chris's mother, Kathy, had an attorney friend. And this attorney showed up at Nina's door telling her that she was going to be served. And she was served with a protection order, being told that she was no longer allowed to see Faith because Chris's family was filing for emergency custody. Honestly, in my opinion, if all of this is true, the nerve that the Proudfoot family has to sneak in when this mother is experiencing her child being so sick she's hospitalized, and then to swoop in, take her daughter, and then try to steal her daughter from her by filing these emergency custody orders and playing the court system card. It's very sinister in my opinion. And I can say all of that because in the end, Nina would end up winning and she would end up getting custody back of Faith. But she claims that Chris's family was relentless. The court ended up deciding that they needed to do the custody exchange at the sheriff's office at the police station because obviously things were probably going to get volatile when Chris's family had to give the custody back to Nina. However, she claims that when she went to get Faith back, Chris's family not only pulled out their cameras and began filming her and basically acting like fools, she also claims that they ended up tossing Faith at her. And then when she tried to put Faith in the car seat where her other children were also in the vehicle, she claims Chris got into the driver's seat and his mother, Kathy, told him to run her over with the car. Wild. I would love to see that video footage that his family filmed, thinking that they were doing the right thing and that they were being smart by filming that. Either way, there was a bunch of other stuff thrown in there. It wasn't as just cut and dry as her getting the baby. There was basically a huge fight. She ran into the police station. The police officers didn't seem as concerned, it seemed, from her point of view, which is awful, considering this should have been like a monitored custody exchange. I don't know why this was allowed to play out the way it did. But either way, she ended up getting her vehicle back in her own possession and she ended up getting her kids in the car. And when she ended up driving away, her father was waiting nearby in his vehicle and he ended up escorting her essentially back to New Mexico. They had to drive all the way back there, but she claims when they fled and they ended up driving back to New Mexico, Chris's family tailed them the entire way back and essentially followed them and stalked them back to New Mexico. Nina also claims that when she finally got back to New Mexico, she tried to file for divorce. However, Chris immediately began calling CPS on her. He began dragging out the divorce proceedings. And during all of this, she also claims that Chris immediately moved in 
with Katie while him and Nina were still married. It means Chris moved on extremely fast, which Nina says she should have seen as a red flag because he's had four other wives, as we all know now. Nina being one of his ex-wives, he has four ex-wives and now Katie. So he's on his fifth marriage. And in my opinion, he's the common denominator here. That, that screams red flags to me, you know? And I'm really, really curious what his other ex-wives have to say. Now, despite all this arguing and bickering, Chris actually would get to spend time with Faith and he seemed to take her for weeks or so at a time. And she claims that when she would be able to face time with Faith while she was at her father's home, she would occasionally see Katie in the background, but she claims that she had no interaction really with Katie. She didn't know much about her at all. And she also didn't know anything or have any relationship with Sebastian. Now, even though Faith is around six years old, this time this has been going on for six years it seems nina says that they still live in fear to this very day here we are faith is six i'm still living in this nightmare that he's created we live in fear every single day we're constantly watching over our backs my kids don't even know what A normal child who should feel like because they were exposed to all this when, at a very young age the awful things that other people could do my oldest daughter said it best she said mom i feel like i was robbed of my childhood because of chris because of everything that he's done i've had to grow up so quick to to protect my siblings and, and you protecting us and always living in fear. Being called to the office and wondering if Child Protective Services was there. She's 15 now and still hates to go to the office because of everything that he's done and his family has done. I feel helpless because I, I can't, I, I feel like there's, I can't protect them enough. And I wish there was more that I can do. We're still living in this nightmare. We're still going to court. He still complains about everything when it's not his way. Nina also made claims that I found very interesting that Chris has friends in law enforcement. Now, I'm pretty sure she said he had friends in law enforcement in New Mexico, but hey, it, it makes me question things. To this day, it seems like Chris is still trying to make Nina's life a living hell to the point that she said she ended up moving Faith from the school she was in to a school on the reservation where her other son and daughter actually go to or they go to schools near there because it was more convenient then if all the kids were going to school near each other so that they could all be dropped off around the same spot and it wasn't as much driving. However, she claims that when she made this move where she moved Faith to this other school, Chris once again took this as some kind of sign that he could once again try to file for full custody like she was doing something wrong by just changing her school. I don't know. It, at every turn, it seems like Chris tries to use anything he can against Nina to try to gain this full custody instead of just everyone being adults. You know, you get your allotted week in here, you get your allotted week in there. Let's put the children first and stop dragging these children continuously through the court system and through the mud. It's just, it's a mess. It seems, in my opinion, like Chris and his family love to play this ego game. From everything that I've seen, from the, the last few weeks where all these interviews have been coming out, we'll talk a little bit about some more of the interviews and the new information from those in a moment. But, you know, Chris and Katie have gone on multiple different YouTubers podcasts now. They've gone on Nancy Grace, which... The all of those were a whirlwind, let me tell you. If you haven't seen them, I recommend going to watch those. But Seth has also gone on all of these podcasts as well. So just from everything that I've been seeing and now Nina coming forward, telling her side of the story of her experience with Chris, it really is like checking off all of these red flags and strange coincidences for me. It's just one of these things where Chris seems to really like to use the legal system in his advantage. We'll talk about 
more of that in a little bit uh, when it involves Seth as well. But he just really, really seems to like to try to play these cards and to manipulate people by threatening action against them, essentially. So let's look a little more into the similarities of what people in the past have been saying, comparing them to the situation that's now at hand with Sebastian being missing. Now, regarding Chris's very military strict parenting style, not only did Nina make accusations that Chris backhanded not only her daughter, but her three-year-old son and split both of their lips open. She also made claims that he was slamming a newborn baby inside of a car seat against a wall and throwing it on a coffee table because the baby was crying. But now we have to get into the claims and accusations about him being physically abusive with Sebastian because Chris would fully admit during two different interviews that he used a belt to hit Sebastian. Now, according to Chris, he admitted using this belt to smack Sebastian on the behind stating he was wearing his clothing. And he says he did this after lying about not wearing a belt or lying about something. And he pressed that he only did this one time. Now, criminal profiler Pat Brand, who is from Nancy Grace's channel when this interview all happened, he has now come on to say that he believes Chris is lying about the number of times that he beat Sebastian with the belt. Sebastian even at one point tried to tell his teacher that he was being hit with a belt and CPS ended up being called because his teacher is a mandated reporter. Now, according to Chris, CPS showed up while they were eating dinner and nothing basically happened. They ruled it was just a kid telling lies essentially, and he essentially called Sebastian a liar about what happened. Now, there seems to have been multiple CPS complaints. However, according to Chris, Sebastian mistakenly described the same incident three times. Again, essentially calling Sebastian a liar. Would a kid really lie to their teachers about being physically abused at home? Ask yourself that. On top of that, Seth, Sebastian's own father was never notified about these CPS calls and only found out about them after hearing it on the YouTube videos where Chris and Katie were being asked these questions. And Seth was actually really hurt that he never knew about this stuff and that he was never informed of this stuff until his son was missing. Seth has also said that Sebastian never really said anything to him about his relationship with Chris and his mother or about you know, his experiences at their house. However, he did say um, the time before he brought him back, Sebastian did not want to go home whatsoever. But he, you know, told Sebastian, you know, that's your mother. You want to go home and spend time with her, basically. And I know it's eating Seth up a lot that he's finding out all this information and looking, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty, thinking, I should have done something. I should have maybe known something was up. Like if I had known that this was happening, maybe he wouldn't be missing now. But when I look at all of this stuff from what Nina's accusing him of, to then Sebastian literally telling teachers he was being hit with a belt and allegedly abused. It makes me think that Chris may have a history of violence towards children. I don't think that's too far-fetched. And it may seem like Sebastian was calling out for help, yet no one was listening, he was ignored and called a liar. We also have to remember again, that Chris seems to be the common denominator here in my opinion. He has four ex-wives and now the wife he's currently with has a missing child. On top of that, his ex-wife accuses him of previously attempting to kidnap their child with the help of his family. It's, it's strange and it's weird. And I, it's giving red flags in my opinion. It's very, very weird. And as we've learned, Chris and his family have this weird, strange pattern of control. We have Chris's sister, Melissa, involved in both situations where she was the one watching Nina's son and involved with that drop off where Chris and his family essentially filed these protection orders and took her daughter from her, drug her through months and months of trauma. But Melissa was also one of the last people to see Sebastian alive the day of his disappearance when they were allegedly all shopping together. Sebastian was out with his two aunts, some of his cousins and his mother that day. And it gets scarier because there's also multiple YouTubers who have claimed that when they've been in the area reporting on Sebastian's disappearance, going near the home, that Chris's family has been following them. Where's Sebastian, do you know? Good afternoon. Good afternoon, JLR Investigates. We're out here covering the case of missing Sebastian. Do you know where Sebastian is? 
Hello, sir. I know that you just came out of the Prophet's home. Do you know where Sebastian is? Seth Rogers himself has come out in interviews saying that not only have his volunteers been being followed while they've been handing out flyers, but Seth says he himself has been followed while he's been trying to search for his son and that he has reported all of this to the TBI. The Cajun Navy who went in there after the Riley Strain case and decided to start helping look for Sebastian Rogers as well have now pulled out because they have been getting death threats and they were being followed it seemed too. Like this is getting scary. Why are these people trying to search for Sebastian and find him, the ones being given death threats and being followed. It's very, very weird. And who are these people following them? Because according to the YouTubers that are being followed, they say it's Chris's family. And honestly, the fact that Chris's family followed Nina and stalked her all the way back to New Mexico after she legally was given custody back of her daughter, there seems to be a pattern. The Proudfoot family seems to be the only ones with allegations against them of stalking and following. Is there a pattern of behavior here? Let me know. Now let's talk about Katie for a moment because we've been doing a lot of talking about Chris and his family, but from what I've seen, there's a lot more people now talking about Katie's story about the night that Sebastian disappeared. And apparently she's got a bunch of different accounts of what happened. In a post they've seen on Medium, it says, and I quote, in the first version, Katie says Sebastian went to his room, closed his door, and then went to bed at 9 p.m. She woke up in the following day at around 6 a.m. and went to Sebastian's room to wake him up for school, but he was gone. In the second version, Katie heard a thud at around 10 p.m. and yelled to Sebastian to go to bed. She didn't check the noise because she wanted to give Sebastian, a teenager, his privacy. In the third version, Katie yells at Sebastian, asking what happened and if he's okay after hearing the thud, and she claims that Sebastian replied, everything is fine, and either I'm going to bed or go ahead, go to bed, end quote. It's also now been noted that Katie has claimed she was on the phone all night with Chris. And this is because they are often long distance from each other. Chris works out of state quite often, maybe for weeks to months at a time. And so they're constantly on the phone together, you know, keep their relationship alive. And I've seen them getting some hate from that. I even see Nancy Grace was questioning that a lot. Like she thought that was odd that they were constantly on the phone together. People are saying, why doesn't she spend more time with her son? Why is she on the phone with her man? And here's the thing, I am not a Chris Katie supporter, as you may have guessed. They do have a lot of things that are really sketchy, red flags, the things that make me question, even if they didn't do anything to Sebastian, their stories and just their motivations are just very odd. I'm not saying they did anything. I don't know if they did anything, none of us do. But there's just something odd about them. But I will say as someone who is in a long distance marriage as well, my husband lives in a completely different country from me. My husband and I are on either FaceTime or on the headsets while we're playing video games on Discord, like as often as we can, like I'd say 24 seven, but you know, we both work as well. So when we're not at work, we're always on the phone with each other for the same reason. And we actually sleep on FaceTime together every single night. And we wake up in the morning still on FaceTime together. So I don't see anything weird about that. I know a lot of people are speculating about that, but that is the one thing out of all of this that doesn't seem strange to me because I do have experience with being in a long distance relationship. But I do find it weird that Katie has these different details that she's giving out in different interviews interviews that when you put them all together, it is strange and it makes you question, okay, what did happen then? Why hasn't she said from the start that she heard a thud in Sebastian's room and then she had a conversation with him? Cause that's a point of reference where he was in his room and still allegedly fine. If she was talking to him, even through his door at 10 PM that night, that wasn't said until a recent interview where her and Chris, let me tell you, I'll have it linked down below. This interview is wild. Chris is extremely, in my opinion, aggressive in this interview. He is spilling information about stuff that I'm just like, maybe you should talk to a lawyer about, honestly, in my opinion. Like he's saying things about him hitting Sebastian with the belt and his parenting style and just he talks about everything. It's very, very odd in my opinion, the switch up from when they were on a smaller YouTuber's channel being interviewed and being asked even hard questions on there. Chris was getting extremely aggravated. He was very defensive the entire time and he was spilling information that has never been talked about before. But then when he goes on Nancy Grace's YouTube channel, he is very to the point, doesn't give any information and it's just yes ma'am, no ma'am very big switch up. And I was the first thing that I noticed when seeing both interviews. That leads me to one of the biggest questions that I've been seeing. And one of the biggest questions I have, which is why aren't Katie and Chris searching? Why is Seth the only one actively boots on the ground every single day searching for his son? I also have questions of why when Katie and Chris do interviews, why Katie doesn't have any emotion at all. She has this very flat effect and I understand 
Everyone reacts differently to their children being missing. She even said she cries behind the scenes, et cetera, et cetera. She's just so docile and she's so quiet. And then Chris is so aggressive and it's just weird to me. So jumping back to Chris and Katie also not searching. On top of that, Chris and Katie left their family home where Sebastian disappeared from, got in a RV and left, just left the state. Don't know where they went. They hit the road together, but they couldn't help search for her missing son. It's weird. It's collectively odd. I don't know. It's weird to me that you'd leave the home where your child is missing from. I understand it's been a month. You can't just sit there, I guess, day in and day out and do nothing and not live any part of life or go to work or do anything. You know, bills have to be paid. I get it. I get it. But it's just collectively odd that you can get up and go off with your man, but you can't go help search. It's weird. Now, I did see that Katie said she had taken a polygraph test and passed. However, Chris claims he has not taken a polygraph test because police told him he doesn't need to because he was at work and not in the area at the time. Which again, polygraphs aren't always accurate. So that's a conversation for another day. Now let's talk about Seth Rogers, Sebastian's father, because he actually did an interview the other day and he said some interesting things that when you add all of that stuff up, it leads me to wonder a number of things. When Seth was asked during this interview where he thinks Sebastian is, this is what he had to say. Is alive and what do you think he's doing right now? Uh, pretty sure he's probably playing video games somewhere. Nobody's letting him, you know, whoever's got him, they're not letting him see the regular news. They're not letting him surf the internet. Or else he'd know that I'm looking for him. And he'd know that he should actually be trying to get a hold of me. And that keeps me going. Now, why would he think that Sebastian is just off somewhere playing video games? and not being allowed to watch the news and he doesn't know his father's searching for him. In my opinion, that's an oddly specific thing to say happened to your missing child. Now I will say right here that I don't think Seth had anything to do with his son being missing. There's conspiracies about every single person in Sebastian's life. And of course, you know, you should question everyone. No one isn't a suspect until Sebastian's found essentially. However, in my opinion and my belief at this point in time, I don't think Seth is involved. Seth also reported that he did see proof of life of Sebastian leaving Texas Roadhouse with his mother, Katie, the night before he disappeared or that night where he ended up disappearing. And as far as I seen, he did see him leaving the Texas Roadhouse and getting into her vehicle. No one else was with them. It was just Katie and Sebastian getting into the vehicle. So we know up until that point in time, he was alive and well, but I now have seen a lot of people speculating what happened after they left Texas Roadhouse. Is there proof that they ever made it back home? So hearing all of that, hearing that Seth thinks that his son is being hidden somewhere essentially, and he's playing video games and not allowed to see the news and see that he's actually a missing child right now. It really makes me want to consider a lot of this new information we've now learned about Chris's past. And I'm usually not into going into really deep speculation and conspiracy theories and all of that kind of stuff. But it does make me question if we were to look at the full picture of all this new information and now Seth saying this in an interview, if there is a possibility that maybe Chris's family is hiding Sebastian somewhere, just like they did with Nina's daughter, that also makes me wonder if that's why Chris and Katie don't seem too worried in the interviews, why they're not screaming and crying and freaking out that Sebastian's missing because they maybe allegedly know that Sebastian's safe somewhere. Now keep in mind, that's just a theory. We have no idea where Sebastian is or who is involved. None of us do. But when you combine all of that information, it makes me wonder if this is his history repeating itself again and again and again. We keep seeing the same things again and again and again. Chris allegedly abused Nina's children. Chris allegedly abused Sebastian. Chris's family stalked Nina's family. There's now people being stalked and followed in this case. Chris and his family ended up trying to take away Nina's daughter and keeping her away from her. Now Sebastian's missing. It's, it's weird. It's really, really weird, the parallels. Now, again, we don't know. We don't know at all. But it's just very, very strange. And there's a lot of these odd coincidences happening. And so I thought we should all just sit down and talk about all of this new information and this drama, if you will, of all this stuff coming out. I also find it really interesting that Chris went from being married to a woman who seemed to be very much okay with speaking up against him and kind of standing up to him to a woman like Katie, who seems very passive and quiet and agreeable, especially in interviews. Chris always seems to lead the interview and take over the interview and kind of talk over, even though they play it off like that's not how it is. 
we all see it. We see how like aggressive and dominant he is in these conversations and in these interviews. What I also find really interesting is that both Katie and Chris have really good paying jobs and the neighborhood they live in and the home they live in is also a very pricey home. I actually looked up on realtor.com and one of the homes in that construction lot of that new development that's being built next to their kind of area they live in is actually starting to sell at around $500,000. So keeping that in mind, I also learned that Katie is a commercial installation technician for Brink Homes, which is a professional home security system installation company. Yet we would also learn that the Proudfoot home allegedly has no security surveillance system in it. No security alarms on the doors, no ring doorbell, no like emergency floodlights or anything like that. If, if someone approaches a home, there's no lights that turn on. And of course that's not mandatory, but people in this day and age usually have at least one form of security on their home. And it's just weird to me that they have literally no security on their home at all. Considering Katie works for a company that literally installs home security systems, I think they'd be conscious about the security of their own home. And you'd think living in a more expensive area with a more expensive home, you'd wanna protect your home. It's just weird to me. But she also claims that the front door was locked when she woke up, which they also have a touch like number pad on their door to lock the door, it seems like. So if Sebastian had left the house, he could have probably punched the number in because he didn't know it. However, I find it weird that the door was locked, but she also claimed that she doesn't believe Sebastian would have went out the window of his bedroom because there was mulch outside of his bedroom window and bushes that he would have had to step into. On top of that, as far as we know, if he had been barefoot walking into this mulch, because again, he'd left the house with allegedly no shoes on, the dogs didn't track any scent as far as we now know. So if Sebastian had gone out his window or had gone out the front door, you think they would have smelt him there, especially if he was barefoot. Yet apparently there's no scent, which is so weird. How did he leave the home then? Riddle me that because none of it makes sense. Now, just collectively from the comment sections to what I've seen other YouTubers saying and, and other interviewers saying, there's this like collective agreement that everyone has been questioning the actions of Chris and Katie, their odd interviews, and everyone's kind of just going, hmm, it's just odd. Again, I've seen people questioning if Sebastian even made it home after dinner. Is there proof that he made it home? Is there actual like neighbor statements saying that they seen Sebastian at home that night? Someone other than Chris, Katie, or Chris's family. Is there proof of life? There is that alleged video of him getting into his mother's car in the parking lot of Texas Roadhouse. But what happened after that? What happened that night to Sebastian? Another thing I wanted to add before we go here, there has been drama apparently about a GoFundMe that Seth's sister set up because apparently as far as I understand the drama, Seth, Katie, and Chris made an agreement that they weren't going to make a GoFundMe to help find Sebastian. They all seem to have pretty good jobs. It seems like they have the funds to fund this stuff. However, it seems like Seth's sister wanted to set up a GoFundMe because Seth has literally been boots on the ground searching for his son every single day. And he has not been at work for over a month at this point which, you know, eventually catches up to you. You need to eventually have some kind of money coming in. Not everyone has an endless amount of savings. So from what it seems, Seth's sister set up a GoFundMe to help Seth raise money to help him search for Sebastian, essentially. And when Chris apparently found out about this, he got pissed off, which honestly, I don't see a problem with. If people want to donate money to this, I don't see a problem. No one's holding a gun to their head and forcing them to give you know, Seth and his family or whoever money, even if Chris and Katie set up a GoFundMe, no one's forcing anyone to send money to these people. However, apparently Chris got a word of this and he ended up turning around and allegedly threatening Seth with getting an attorney involved, which sounds like another pattern to me. Chris always seems to threaten those around him with legal action when he doesn't like what's going on or he's not getting his way. He did it with Nina. And now it's happening again with the situation. Again, another pattern that we're seeing. What I want to know is what you all think. What do you think about all of this new information, all of this drama that has come out? Do you see the same patterns that I'm seeing? It's just odd. There's no other way to put it. It's just really odd. It might all mean nothing, but if anything, it's odd. Now, before we go, I do have some really important information. Seth Rogers has a new volunteer location this week at a restaurant in Hendersonville. So if anyone is out there and wants to help support 
find Sebastian and actually be actively involved. If you live in the area, if you're able to travel to the area, Seth is looking for anyone he can get to help search for his son. So they actually have a new volunteer location, which is at a restaurant called The Rudder, and it's at 126 River Road in Hendersonville, Tennessee. The restaurant's actually given him access to be able to set up like a headquarters there, like a base camp for all the volunteers. And apparently this restaurant has given Seth and the searchers full access to their parking lot until Sebastian's found. So if you're in the area and you're able to go help Seth, please go help. I wish I had the means to be able to fly to Tennessee to go help in the search. I really truly do. Unfortunately, I don't have the finances for that right now, but if you're able to, please go help Seth search. Sebastian is out there somewhere and the more people that could go and cover area and even just look, the better chance we have at finding Sebastian or evidence of what happened to him. But that is kind of a rundown of all of this various information that's been coming out over the last week or so in the Sebastian Rogers case. And what I really wanna know is how you're all feeling about this new information. Is there any kind of leads or theories or stuff that you've seen that I haven't seen that you want to chat about? Let's have a conversation down in the comment section. I'm not accusing anyone of anything. We obviously, again, no one knows what happened to Sebastian. No one knows who's actually involved. I think we can collectively agree that this is odd. This new information is odd. What Nina's saying is very concerning. So let's keep chatting about that down below. And my heart goes out to Sebastian's family. I truly hope that he is found and I truly hope he is found alive. If more stuff comes out, I'm going to continue keeping you all updated about Sebastian's case. I know Seth wants people to continue talking about his son's disappearance and he has actively, you know, praised social media and YouTubers and stuff like that and wanting them to continue to talk. So I'm going to do my part, even though I have a very small channel to continue to talk about Sebastian and his disappearance. And if you're able to share Sebastian's missing persons flyer, I'm sure that would be an amazing help as well. Or if you have any tips, I'll have information linked down below to send in tips, but I will continue to keep you all updated. And as always, I hope you all stay safe out there, lock your windows and doors, and I hope to see you in the next video.